There's a group of authors who have been called the Four Horsemen of Atheism. Today we're going to talk about one of them, and I'm going to show you some stuff that apparently all of his fans have failed to notice. Going back a few years now, atheist Christopher Hitchens put out a provocative new book called God Is Not Great. And just in case the title doesn't make you aware of his position on God, the designers made the cover on some editions feature a lowercase g for God and an uppercase g for the word great, which is the pattern you find all the way through the rest of the book. The word God is never capitalized. Hitchens was making it plain as day that he thought very little of the God of the Bible, even though most people tend to use capitalization as a simple gesture of respect when referring to the deities of other people's religions. And I know, the word God is not really a proper noun in the traditional sense, but it is one of the shorthand names we use for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I should probably admit that I'm a little bit late to the game with today's show because the author has been dead for roughly a decade already, but, well, this show didn't exist at the time, and the book he wrote is still in circulation. So, I guess in a sense, he made sure that his rather stringent ideas about faith would survive him, and his influence does continue after his death. So, I thought maybe we should still talk about it, because I happen to have a much different opinion, and I do think that God is great. Mr. Hitchens was a journalist and a lover of literature who frankly hated religion. And not just any particular religion, but all religion. He described it as poison, even though he was raised with it. And I suspect that's where the real problem actually lies. How this man was raised with religion, because that can often make all the difference in the world. Not that his descriptions of early childhood reveal any serious problems, because they don't. And often people from exemplary religious homes still go on to reject the faith of their parents. Hitchens' book starts with a description of a kindly school teacher named Gene Watts, who used to teach Hitchens and his schoolmates lessons about scripture and nature. She would take the kids outdoors and help them identify birds, trees, and plants, and she would openly marvel about the goodness of the Creator. And according to Hitchens, she once made a statement that started him down the path toward unbelief. Here's how he describes it. He says, However, there came a day when poor dear Mrs. Watts overreached herself. Seeking ambitiously to fuse her two roles as nature instructor and Bible teacher, she said, So you see, children, how powerful and generous God is. He has made all the trees and grass to be green which is exactly the color that is most restful to our eyes. Imagine if instead the vegetation was all purple or orange, how awful that would be. Now, that statement seems innocent enough, and while it might be an expression of somebody's simple faith and a personal opinion, Hitchens said that her insistence that colors were made for human benefit seemed ludicrous to him. Now, I could probably comment on that for a bit, because unfortunately for Mr. Hitchens, Science seems to slowly be moving in the direction of suggesting that Mrs. Watts was at least partially right. But let's just keep forging ahead. Hitchens continues, and I want you to pay attention to this rather caustic language, because that kind of language is a major feature of this book. He says, And now behold what this pious old trout hath wrought. Now, just in case old trout is a moniker you've never heard before, it's used to describe an annoying old woman, or even a bad-tempered old person, which completely contradicts his next paragraph, where he describes what a lovely person she was and how much he liked her. That's what we would call an ad hominem attack. It's a classical, logical fallacy, where you attack the holder of an idea instead of dealing with the idea itself. He's setting the table for you to dislike Mrs. Watts before you even know what she said. And the reason I'm pausing to point this out is because this is an unfortunate pattern you find all the way through the book. Mr. Hitchens seems utterly incapable of dealing strictly with ideas. It seems like he, he can't help himself. He applies angry insults to everybody and everything he doesn't like over and over and over again. 
And honestly, you'd think that someone like Hitchens, an accomplished writer, a journalist, would know that he's contradicting himself when he describes this kindly old teacher with such a demeaning insult. But there you have it. And, and, and so I guess I'm a little disappointed that someone with Hitchens' considerable credentials proved to be such a careless writer, to the point where he gets a lot of simple details, well, just wrong. I mean, take, for example, the brief paragraph where he goes after Mr. William Miller, a retired army officer who converted from deism and became a Baptist preacher, and almost single-handedly launched a nationwide revival in the middle of the 19th century. Here's how Hitchens describes this man. And remember, his real name is William Miller. He writes, In 1844, one of the greatest American religious revivals occurred, led by a semi-literate lunatic named George Miller. Mr. Miller managed to crowd the mountaintops of America with credulous fools who, having sold their belongings cheap, became persuaded that the world would end on October 22 that year. Well, first of all, Mr. Hitchens, his name was William, and he was anything but semi-literate. Now, it's true that he set a date for the return of Christ, and you've probably noticed by now that he was wrong about that. But wouldn't you know it, I've actually taken the time to read William Miller's books, and I can tell you he was anything but semi-literate. In fact, I would say that Miller's work is far less sloppy than Hitchens' work. And while he was clearly wrong about giving a date to the return of Christ, a date, by the way, that he easily found in the text of Daniel chapter 8, I mean, William Miller was hardly the only person on this planet to notice that date. But assigning the date to the Second Coming was a basic mistake that simply took Miller down the wrong road. Anybody who was actually bothered to read Miller's work can see that he wasn't a raving lunatic. It's well-researched, well-argued, and well-presented. There is no comparing what Miller wrote to the likes of Jim Jones or Marshall Applewhite or all of these other apocalyptic cult leaders we've heard about. Miller's work is calm and reasonable, and obviously written by someone who had a decent grasp of history. But Mr. Hitchens clearly didn't know that, because he didn't even know the man's name. He just threw an ill-informed and salacious story into his manuscript, condensing a major American Christian revival movement into four short sentences. And I guess he just assumed that his readers would never take the time to look it up. And obviously, his editors didn't think so either. But unfortunately for them, I have read it. And so it goes with the rest of Hitchens' book. It reads more like an angry screed than a work of history, psychology, or philosophy. And while I'm clearly not an atheist, I do respect the work of thoughtful atheists, because at least they aren't shooting from the hip and dumping out all their personal frustrations in a book. But back to Mrs. Jean Watts now, the teacher, because Hitchens claims that she was the starting point for his journey into disbelief when she suggested that colors somehow benefit the human race. Here's what he says. He writes, I was frankly appalled by what she said. My little ankle strap sandals curled with embarrassment for her. At the age of nine, I had not even a conception of the argument from design or of Darwinian evolution as its rival or of the relationship between photosynthesis and chlorophyll. The secrets of the genome were as hidden from me as they were at that time to everyone else. I had not then visited the scenes of nature where almost everything was hideously indifferent or hostile to human life, if not life itself. I simply knew, almost as if I had privileged access to a higher authority, that my teacher had managed to get everything wrong in just two sentences. The eyes were adjusted to nature and not the other way about. And honestly, that's it. As a young boy, he took exception to the idea that the world was somehow designed for our enjoyment. That's what turned this sweet old teacher into, and I quote, a pious old trout. I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. Sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. 
So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. One of the claims that Christopher Hitchens makes is that he was very biblically literate. And he says that religious objectors to his ideas were always confounded by his supposedly broad biblical knowledge. Here's, here's how he puts it. I frequently passed top in my scripture class. It was my first introduction to practical and textual criticism. I would read all the chapters that led up to the verse and all the ones that followed it to be sure that I had got the point of the original clue. I can still do this, greatly to the annoyance of some of my enemies." Now, I gotta say, I don't know who was handing out grades in that particular scripture class, but I can assure you, I've taught more than one scripture class over my lifetime, and the stuff I find in this book would hardly put Mr. Hitchens at the top of the class. I mean, maybe he was able to recite a few Bible verses from memory, but his overall grasp of the subject was even worse than his grasp of religious history. And honestly, it's hard to know where I should start with this because there is so much bad information in Hitchens' book that I could probably put together a mini-series. He seems to take tired old caricatures of religion and knock them down like straw men instead of actually dealing with the very real ideas that have carried Christianity forward over the last 2,000 years. But if I'm going to zero in on just one area for a few minutes, maybe let's talk about his assessment of the Old and New Testaments, to which he devotes one chapter apiece. And with the time we've got, I think it might be beneficial to look at his complaints about Moses. And then if we have more time, we can always go on from there. As Hitchens is getting ready to assassinate the credibility of the Old Testament, here's what he writes. He says, a further difficulty is the apparent tendency of the Almighty to reveal Himself only to unlettered and quasi-historical individuals in regions of Middle Eastern wasteland that were long the home of idol worship and superstition. Well, wrong again, Mr. Hitchens. The Old Testament is centered on the notion of breaking away from idol worship and superstition. But then from that point, Hitchens goes on to start discussing the person of Moses, whose writings undergird the three big monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Moses is easily one of the most revered religious figures in world history. And what Hitchens does is try to turn you against Moses by suggesting that he was probably unlettered and not even real. Now, I can see all kinds of people cheering for that notion, particularly if they don't want to read the Old Testament or recognize that it might have any kind of credibility or authority. That would make sense for people to feel that way. But if you're going to oppose something, at least make sure you're opposing the real thing, instead of a straw man constructed by somebody with an axe to grind. To describe Moses as illiterate or unlettered is frankly being dishonest with the story itself. Moses was a Hebrew child adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter and raised in the palaces of Egypt, where he got a first-rate education by the most advanced civilization of his day. Egypt, frankly, was the same place that people like Plato or Pythagoras went to get educated. Plato studied in Egypt for 13 years, and Pythagoras studied in Memphis because the Egyptian priests had superior knowledge of things like medicine and astronomy. Egypt was the most literate place on earth. But what Hitchens does is place people like Moses in, a, and I quote, Middle East wasteland. That's just dishonest. I mean, our very word alphabet has roots in the Semitic languages. The Greeks got their alpha beta from the Hebrew aleph bet. And that's because the Hebrews were one of the earliest literate societies on the planet. But where Mr. Hitchens really begins to flounder is in his assessment of perhaps one of the greatest moral contributions of the Hebrew people to modern civilization, and that's the Decalogue, or the Ten Commandments. Now, honestly, in my experience, the only people who really have a problem with the moral principles found in the Ten Commandments are people who do not wish to live by them. But that's probably another subject for another day. Here's how Hitchens starts in on the Big Ten. He writes, The first three commandments, he says, are all variations of the same one, in which God insists on His own primacy and exclusivity, forbids the making of graven images, and prohibits the taking of His own name in vain. In the next sentence, in typical Hitchens style, he calls these first three commandments, and I quote, prolonged throat clearing on God's part. 
as if that's some kind of serious argument. Hitchens is making a ridiculous caricature out of the God of the Old Testament, suggesting that the people who actually believe the Bible are some kind of mindless idiots who just accept what they're told and never do any real kind of thinking. This is a childish, dismissive approach, and one of the big problems with this is that it conveniently ignores thousands of pages of supplemental material in the Bible designed to help you understand what those moral commandments might mean for your personal life. The God that Hitchens describes is some kind of schoolyard bully who says, look, you do things my way or else. But the thoughtful people who have actually studied the Bible for thousands of years now don't seem to come to that same conclusion. What they find is that the Ten Commandments and the moral principles they describe make absolute perfect sense. Now, I understand that some of you don't believe the Bible is anything more than another ancient document full of fairy tales, kind of like Hitchens did. But at least if you're going to refute it, be honest about it, and deal with the entire text. Either Mr. Hitchens had serious lapses in memory, or he wasn't entirely honest. Let me give you an example of his dishonesty. At one point in his book, he goes after the famous media personality Dennis Prager, a practicing Jew who apparently consented to join Hitchens in a debate just before 9-11. And at one point in their discussion, Mr. Prager asked Hitchens a really interesting question. He said, Imagine that you're in a strange city and it's getting dark outside, and you see a large group of men approaching you. The question Prager asked is, would you feel safer or less safe to learn that they were coming from a Bible study? Now, that was a decent question, because of course, most of us would probably relax a bit knowing that we were facing a Bible study group in a dark alley. And the reason this is an important question is because the effect that belief has on people and society is important. It's one thing to call religion poison and condemn it like Hitchens did, suggesting that the Bible has done nothing but make society worse, but it's quite another thing to realize that most of us instinctively realize that the opposite is true. Of course it's good news to find out that a menacing mob is actually a Bible study group. But what Hitchens did when he wrote his book was either forgetful or dishonest. He said the question he was asked was, would you feel safer or less safe if you were to learn that they were just coming from a prayer meeting? That was not the question. The question was Bible study. And of course, by changing it into something else, Hitchens managed to dodge the question because, of course, there are people who pray to all kinds of gods and then go out and perform horrible deeds. I mean, the group in the alley could have been a terrorist cell who had just prayed to their vengeful and violent God, which would be bad news. Honestly, you find so much of that kind of disingenuity in Hitchens' book that it becomes hard to take any of his arguments seriously. But would you look at that? The clock is running out on me and I gotta take a break right now. So hang in there because in a moment, I'm gonna show you why Christopher Hitchens really, really doesn't understand the subject. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. So let's go back to the Ten Commandments again and see if they don't make really good sense. Remember, George Hitchens, oh, Christopher Hitchens, not that names matter, referred to the first three commandments as prolonged throat clearing by God in order to make his audience skip over them quickly. It's not unlike what a magician does when he's trying to keep you from seeing how he does his trick. He shows you something shiny with one hand while the other hand is quietly making stuff disappear. It's distraction. So, let's suppose for a moment that the Creator God of the Bible is real. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I do believe that. I think He's real, which should be pretty obvious to all of you. And if you aren't a believer, just work with me here for a moment and let's suppose that it's true. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is real and there is only one God. Now let's suppose 
that that creator is the source of all life, the one who made the universe in the first place and the one who continues to sustain it, which is the teaching of the Bible. Now, let's read those first three commandments from that perspective, assuming those things. You'll find them in Exodus chapter 20, where it says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Well, there you have it, the first three commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a graven image. And number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The question is this, are those the rantings of a petty deity from Mount Olympus who has to have things his own way? Or do they make good sense when you place them in the context of the entire Bible? I mean, think about this. Let's suppose there really is only one God the way the Bible says. That would mean there are no other gods, and you're completely wasting your time by worshiping something else. Nothing else in the universe is the origin of your existence, and you're going to be causing yourself irreparable harm by placing your affections elsewhere. The prophet Jeremiah expanded on that thought by saying, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. If there is a loving God, and he sees you placing your hopes in all the wrong places, what kind of God would he be to not steer you back to your best and highest good? What kind of God would let you harm yourself and not say anything about it? Let's take a look at what the Bible actually says about this one true Creator God and what He's like. When Solomon dedicated the second temple, he said, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you how much less this temple which I have built. In other words, God is bigger than we can possibly comprehend with our finite human brains. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, the Bible says, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The book of Genesis states that you and I were made in God's image. But when we worship mere idols, we remake God in our own image. We make God what we want Him to be and we reduce him to something much smaller than he really is, which, to be honest, is something else I find all the way through Hitchin's book. He's forever setting up what he thinks God should be like, and then he condemns God for not being that way. If God is real, and he's as big as the Bible suggests, it only makes sense that we don't lose sight of that and start boiling him down to some kind of ridiculous caricature. So, the second commandment makes sense, too. What about this idea that we shouldn't be taking God's name in vain? Some people say this refers to rough language or cussing, and I guess in some ways they might be right. But the concept runs a whole lot deeper than that. In the biblical world, your name was significant. It stood for your character. And when it talks about God's name, it's talking about His essence, His essential character. What God does in the biblical narrative is invite people to take His name, to enter into a covenant with Him, almost like a bride taking her husband's name. But it's not just an empty label. What God is doing in this covenant relationship is asking us to reflect His perfect character to the world. So taking God's name in vain means treating that responsibility very lightly, something that Hitchens also complains about when he points out that Christians have behaved abysmally over the centuries. And he's right about that. Christians have been guilty of violence. We have run torture chambers. We've been involved in countless financial and sexual scandals, and the list goes on and on and on. All of those would be examples of taking God's name in vain. We say we represent God, and then we betray God through our behavior. And I guess what's ironic about Hitchens complaining about Christian bad behavior is that he's proving there's such a thing as a violation of the third commandment, people who make a train wreck out of God's reputation. 
If God is a God of love and He's perfectly just and perfectly merciful the way the Bible describes, then it's important for His followers to show that to the world. This commandment makes absolute sense. All right, I got to take one last break and then I'll be right back after this. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers in guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. Well, I'm out of time again, but let me just say this one last thing, because Hitchens attacks the idea that sin can be visited on the third and fourth generation, which is what the Bible says. Hitchens rightfully says that the idea that I can be held accountable for my father's sins is wrong. But what he never mentions is that the Bible agrees with him. He just attacks the statement in the Ten Commandments and leaves you there. But the book of Ezekiel plainly states, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father. So maybe, Mr. Hitchens, maybe context matters. I think that most of us can recognize that our own bad choices, even though we're responsible for them, can have an impact on our children. I can see firsthand how my own weaknesses have added unnecessary burdens to my children's lives. I mean, look at the train wreck of humanity and tell me it isn't true. If someone has a temper or a substance abuse problem or an abusive home, tell me that doesn't ripple down through several generations. Tell me that the children of alcoholics don't suffer because of somebody else's choices. Tell me that people who were sexually abused don't sometimes develop a propensity for doing it to somebody else. You know, it's too bad that Mr. Hitchens is gone because I'd love to give him the benefit of the doubt. From, but from where I sit right now, I'm giving him an F for honesty. Or I'd have to assume, given his claim that he was some great student of the scriptures, that he was willfully blind. So maybe another day, we'll look at the rest of the Ten Commandments because honestly, if God exists, then they really do make perfect sense. Meanwhile, I'd like you to read the Bible for yourself instead of going to sloppy books that seem to ignore absolutely everything. This is where you'll find out what the book really says. Thanks for joining me again this week. I'm Sean Boonstra, and this has been Authentic.